I am not a physicist. I am not a very long list of things that I'm not. And I'm in touch with that and I'm okay. If I had been allowed to be what really I think is the best fit for me, I would have been a linguist. What? Sorry. A linguist. Okay. Uh, it was interesting listening to our conversation and participating in our conversation because we all have words that we're very fond of. We have constructs we're very fond of, and we tend to communicate in those whether they communicate or not. Did you notice that? We have phrases, we have words, we have thoughts, we have syllogisms, we have allegories, we have stories. I was, I was watching this, I was thinking of one day in the life of Ivan Denisovich, Alexander Solzhenitsyn's little book, or the Gulag Archipelago, which is Job writ large that took place in Soviet Russia in, the, uh, in Siberia. It's a common phenomenon. Straight. I've got a... Ah, thank you. I have a friend in high places. <laughs> who really knows what's going on. Let me, uh, I, I should give you a brief, uh, kind of my, my evil CV is, that doesn't sound right, does it? <laughs> my evil CV is online, if you'd like to know more about me. I've suffered through 39 years of marriage. I've suffered through seven children. I've suffered through 14 grandchildren. I've suffered through 25 years in the ministry. I've suffered through 20 years in independent business. I've suffered through starting about a half a dozen businesses. None of those in and of themselves are evil, but they were all a source of pain and loss and suffering for me. I should also make the following disclosure. My own personal uh, greatest temptation is the cult of the intellect. This culture is sick with it. There was, in this particular presentation, I'm going to launch into a science because I do that. Um, it was a, a, an irredeemable circumstance where sufferers were trying to comfort themselves with ration. Rational thinking, rational thought, logic. Not possible. It does not connect. The need for comfort and the, uh, the application of rational thought to that need for comfort will never connect. And so what the writer was setting up there was the ultimate frustration between the ability to comfort and the need to comfort. That was fascinating to watch. Um, I, but I need to confess that to you, that I'm an adherent to the cult of the intellect, and I love this culture because I can have commercial conversations here. My own personal prophylaxis for that dilemma is the simplest explanation is the best. Occam's razor? Who doesn't know what Occam's razor is? Okay, we'll get to that in a minute. I'll read about it. Um, it keeps me out of a great deal of trouble. I am, at core, because of that, a biblicist. And that's an important distinction to me, and it's, I use that word advisedly and deliberately. I am not a systematic theologian. I am a biblical theologian because I am a biblicist. To me, the simplest explanation is what's written there, and it can be taken at face value, and it means exactly what God intended it to mean. And my burden is not to synthesize it and put it into a construct. My burden is to understand it and yield to it. So everything I'm sharing with you comes out of that commitment. So. This is more of a disclaimer so that you can dismiss things that you might be concerned about with me. He's a biblicist. What, what else is he going to believe? As a biblical theologian, I prefer exegesis to systematization. Um, my, my question is, what does it say? Having started with what does it say, then I can begin to consider what does it mean and understand that the very best I can do is a subject. What does it mean to me? I can then, this is one of the uh, professional uh, hazards of the ministry, is that I can say, what, what should it mean to you, and tell you, and typically be off base somewhere. But hopefully God has designed a circumstance like tonight where he can speak to you 
and, and say something to you that will work in your heart and your mind and deal with your relationship with God that transcends me. I wouldn't be up here if I didn't believe that was true. So otherwise, this is a, another exercise in futility. So finally, the heart is the battleground rather than the mind. The heart informs the mind, but it's not the battleground. The heart is the battleground. Showing up for an exercise in apologetics with your intellect is like showing up for a gunfight with a knife. It's helpful, but it's not sufficient. It's useful, but it's not going to settle the issue. It's a heart issue. And I should disclose that when I say heart, and I and my decades of studying scripture and working with God's people, the heart is that core of us that makes decisions, that decides what we're going to be loyal to, who we belong to, who we're going to submit to. That's the heart. And that's the core of you that is made in the image of God. And the intellect and the emotions are equivalent. And they feed and nourish and create input for the heart. But the heart is that part of you that takes all of that input and creates life out of it. And responds to the heart of God in a relationship. I'm going to try to weave all this together into an understanding of what evil is really all about. So what is the problem of evil? These are fascinating. And uh, if someone will kindly <laughs> summarize them so I don't have to, they will tell you the, some of the following things. The ones that circle the things that are evil, it's fascinating. You know what? Sex is not evil. Nobody said sex is evil. What a surprise. Wealth is not evil. Oh, come on, this is Cambridge. <laughs> wealth is inherently evil, right? Nobody marked wealth as evil. Apparently everybody in here would like to do wealthy. <laughs> on the other hand, right? I marked not necessarily. Think of, no, you didn't. Yeah. I, oh, didn't oh, I didn't get your thing. Well, But I only put, it's both of those I put conditional. They can be. <laughs> Okay. <laughs> All depends on the condition of your If it's your heart. wealth, it's a good thing. <laughs> <laughs> if it's yours, yeah. it's not. It's evil. <laughs> and the fourth one was poverty. Poverty is not evil. Which is really interesting because one person said hunger is evil, but poverty is not. Another one said uh, greed and lust are evil, but wealth is not. Injustice is evil, but poverty is not. Cruelty is evil, but poverty is not. This is just really interesting. I, I, that's the reason I asked that question. Early on as I was working on this, and I've got a sheaf of notes just that came through from all my years of experiencing evil and pondering evil and wondering where it came from and why it's here and how do I deal with it and how do I, how do I deal with the evil in me. It made me ask that question is evil like art? It's in the eye of the beholder. Actually, there was a, an associate justice that I was that I quoted whose name Potter, Justice Potter, who said, "I don't know what pornography is, but I know it when I see it." And I really think that that's pretty much the condition of the Christian church. We're not really sure what's evil, but we sure know evil when we see it. Well, that creates huge problems when it comes to dealing with evil. And I'm, I'm going to go through some slides that I should have been showing before. <laughs> God's people in history will amend you. Will anyone recognize this? My favorite painting. I've got a copy in my office. That's Jeremiah. It's Rembrandt's Jeremiah lamenting over the sins of God's people. He's sitting on all this wealth and he's just <coughs> broken hearted because of God's people. They're evil. Here is what I've shared with you. I made peace with God when I was 19 years old and still struggled with evil in all of these areas. 
whose problem is evil? That was the other thing that was interesting on these papers. Everybody, with the exception of two, and I don't know who you were, I don't want to know who you were, said, I'm the problem. And evil is a problem for me because of its impact on me. Entirely subjective. Does that strike you as interesting? I don't. I'll bet that if I had a conference, had an opportunity to sit down with you and scratch where you think and scratch away some of the veneer of intellect and emotion and relationships that you tend to cover over the real you with, you would find that you only have a problem with evil because of its impact on you. Nobody has the ability and the, the breadth of compassion and all the things that it would take to really care about evil in the world or evil that other people suffer. It always gets personal and it's always subjective. And we have a tendency, if not I and I'll overstay here because I'm given to that. I don't think anybody cares about anybody else's experience with evil. They care about their own. And that's the problem with evil. Now, personal problem, my view of the world. However, Google, what's Google's mission? What is their rallying cry? Do no evil. Actually, it's not even do no evil. I thought it was. I was going to say that until I looked it up. Don't be evil. Huh? Why would Larry Page care about don't be evil? We don't even know if Larry Page knows what evil is. Well, actually we do because he suffers. And he calls the suffering that he endures the result of evil. And so he says, don't be evil. Let's move to uh, a biblical analysis and an apologetic that at least is an attempt to deal with it. You probably didn't bring your Bible. I should have put the text up there. I spent not too much time thinking and not enough time preparing. <coughs> Genesis chapter 1, we've already talked about it already. 2 9. We've already talked about it already. Forgive me. Out of the ground, the Lord God caused uh, to grow every tree that is pleasing in the sight and good for food. The tree of life also stood in the midst of the garden and the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. Are you the one that asked about the tree of the knowledge of good and evil? Did God create evil? He did create the tree that gave to Adam and Eve the knowledge of evil what do you do with that? We have a God who thought, I am not going to leave out of the garden a tree that they can eat of and no evil. Uh, who doesn't know what the word knowledge means in the Bible? Everybody. Anybody know what the word knowledge, the core of it is? Intimacy. Adam knew who? Eve. What was it talking about? That thing that isn't evil. <laughs> well, no. Sex. It's about sex. It's about intimacy. God created a tree that would give to anyone who ate of its fruit an intimate experience of evil. Let's simmer a minute. Why would God do that? <clears throat> Why would he give Adam and Eve the opportunity to have an intimate, personal experience with evil? Pardon? It's born into it. Not at that point. They're created good. That's at the end of creation where God said everything's good. The tree of the knowledge of intimate knowledge of evil is good. God said it was good. Right? Isn't what's good. No, no, the tree is good. God said that tree is good. The tree that will give you the knowledge of evil is good. I thought God doesn't want them to have that is the knowledge of evil. He has a funny way of showing that. <laughs> maybe maybe the tree represents 
free will. <laughs> the tree is the tree. You can try to make it represent anything you want, but that's creativity on your part. The tree is that which gives an intimate understanding, an intimate experience of evil. Was eating of the tree good? Scripture doesn't say that. It just says the tree was good. Let's, so start, let's start with the basics. So the tree is the ability, right? Is the ability to know the difference. Is the gift, no, not the ability, it's the gift of the experience. Now, when it's, did Adam and Eve... It's the offer of the gift of the experience. No, it's not the tree, right? It's, it's that. It, it looks like an offer, but it really is a tree. But they were forbidden to eat from it. Right. They were told not to. Right. And they, if they'd obeyed, we live in a much different world. So and eating of it must be bad. Eating of it is evil. It had to be, because their only way to experience, have an intimate experience of evil, was to disobey. That was the gift. It wasn't the tree, it wasn't the apple, it was the opportunity to experience evil on a personal, intimate basis by disobeying God. A gift would be a too strong a word for that. That is not exactly Not if you understand God. We're going to make. We're going to get to that point where you're glad it was a gift. <laughs> no, I'm serious. If it wasn't a gift, then the world as we know it would be a hopeless place. Well, I mean, if you have something and you say, "Don't take it from me," and then you take it, it's not exactly a gift. Yeah. But you took it from me. It, it almost <laughs> sounds like you're saying that sin is a gift. I don't see sin in there anywhere. I see evil. I don't see sin. But the only way they could get the gift is by sinning. Yeah. It does say that they sinned when they ate the fruit. The word sin is in there. Yeah, in the description of that. In, in Genesis chapter 1, chapter 2, chapter 3. I don't think the word sin is in chapter 3, is it? I don't know if it's in Genesis, but it's later in Romans when Paul is referring to that. Sure. But, uh, whether the word's in there or not, wouldn't you agree that for them to get the gift, they had to sin, if you think that the knowledge is a gift? Let me go on and okay. try to bring this around to you. <laughs> let, me, let me try to put your mind at ease, Joe. Oh, I mean, my mind is my job. I just okay. <laughs> you just want to be not worried about me, right? No, no, I just want to understand what you're saying. <laughs> okay. Let's go back to the word evil. If you don't understand the word evil, none of this makes any sense at all. Right? In fact, that reminds me. I ran across a uh, Calvin and Hobbes cartoon actually today. Uh, Calvin's doing his homework and he says, Hobbes, what's a paper tiger? And Hobbes says, it's a paper boy. You know, a tiger with a newspaper route. Doesn't that make perfect sense? That's what we take to Scripture, and that's exactly the conclusion we come to. This book just doesn't make any sense because we're hearing Paper Tiger and hearing Paper Boy. We're the problem, not the book. But we'll get to William of Ockham in a minute. The word evil. Is an old Hebrew word, the Aramaic roots, ra'ah, which in its active verb form, which tends to be the core, the original, the, the most likely to be the, that core essence of this pool of meaning that a word becomes, means to break in pieces or shatter. Does that surprise you? It ought to. That's the opposite of shalom. That means shalom is, and I will use a word that I'm fond of and, and ask you to be indulgent, shalom is alignment. Shalom means God and I are aligned. He's this way and I'm this way and everywhere he's this way, I'm the same way, I'm aligned with him. Evil is to be disaligned, to destroy, to break, to shatter. But if you shatter a pot, you were evil to that pot. And it's important to get that simple core meaning of destructiveness. It simply means to break. 
the passive infinitive starts moving in the direction that you're thinking in. You're living with shattering and breaking thousands of years later after thousands of generations, maybe thousands of generations, have had an opportunity to modify that word and add to it. To be harmful. If you're a pot breaker, you are harmful to pots, right? If you are a light bulb breaker, you don't want to be left around light bulbs because you break them. You're a destroyer. You're evil when it comes to light bulbs. Does that make you morally evil? No. You're just evil. That led to the feeling that if you're the pot's owner, and I came along and I took a rock and I smashed a pot, you had an emotional response to losing that pot. You were experiencing some grief because that pot was for dinner tonight and you don't have a pot for dinner tonight and you've got an answer to the rest of the family for going hungry because some guy came along with a rock and broke your pot. You're grieving, you're sad, you're affected by it. And then the next step from grieving is to be displeased. Now I'm mad. I had a pot. You broke my pot. I'm sad you broke my pot. Now that I think about it, I'm mad and you, I'm not letting you anywhere near my pot ever again. In fact, how did you get anywhere near my pot? Well, wait a minute, we're friends? You were visiting? You're an acquaintance? You had proximity to my pot? And then you broke it. You're evil. Isn't that pretty much what's born out with this is evil is that which breaks my pot. Anything that hurts me, anything that causes me pain, anything that takes something from me, brings a loss to me, is evil. <clears throat> By virtue of the loss that I sustain because of what happened. That's the, def that's the core definition of evil. Now, using Occam's razor, Actually, well, that's Occam. Uh, lex parsimoniae means the law of the bare minimum. Parsimonious means nobody can get a nickel out of your pocket. It's a problem solving principle devised by William, who was a Franciscan friar, scholastic philosopher, and theologian. And the principle at its essence, and there's a rather lengthy, and I can't find it, and I shouldn't read it, we're running out of time, uh, that describes how the scientific community uses Occam's principles, that among competing hypotheses, the one with the fewest assumptions should be selected. And as I studied this, I realized that's why I'm a biblicist. The, the fewer the presuppositions we have to deal with, the more likely it is that we're going to come up with something that's accurate. Other, more complicated solutions may ultimately prove correct. See, I really have to give the systematic theologians credit for those times when they stumble into truth. You know, stuff happens. <laughs> that was for you. It's not systematic. But the absence of certainty, in the absence of certainty, the fewer assumptions that are made, the better. Now, we need to define evil the way we're using it. And I've tried to introduce some of these into the pot analogy. Which of the following are necessary for something to be evil? And I would say all of them. There has to be a relationship. Not between you and the pot, but between you and the pot breaker. Unless you and the other person have a relationship when they break your pot, and it can be an enemy and a friend, or a friend and a friend, or a fa two family members. There has to be an existing relationship for that loss to take place within. There has to be a loss of alignment. There has to be intention. It wasn't accidentally... If a pot gets knocked off the table, and the person who knocked it off the table is feeling terrible, and is calling themselves evil, you will comfort them and say, look, it was on the table. It's okay. You didn't mean to do it. Right? And that's you're saying it wasn't evil, it just was an accident, it happened. When it's intentional, then it's evil. 
there has to be a loss. There's no evil that takes place unless there is a loss. There has to be a victim who suffers the loss. There had to have been an alternative, not breaking the pot. There has to be avoidability. If I'm careful, the pot won't get broken. And there has to be the opportunity for reparations and remediation. How do we fix it? How do we make the pot whole again? That's really important. All of these are important to a functioning definition for the way you use the word, use the word evil. Is evil perceptual or objective? That's a very important question we don't have time tonight to deal with. Does evil have independent existence? I, uh, we don't have time to get on that garbage run. This is my understanding of evil. It is transactional. It can't take place in a vacuum. It can't take place alone. It's objective. It is or it isn't. It can be perceived as evil and not be evil. It can be evil and not perceived as evil. It has to be experiential. It has to be something someone experiences. It has to be volitional, which moves it from, moves evil from intellect or emotion to volition, to heart. Evil starts out in the heart. That's why the book of James says what it does about being evil. It always results in a death. Now, death is loss. It doesn't have to be a human death. It doesn't have to be a, an animate object's death. But it has to be a loss. The death of an opportunity. The death of trust. The death of fill, fill in whatever it is that was lost. But there has to be a loss that is some version of death. So here's my working definition of evil. The intentional violation of another's personal sovereignty, meaning it's a pot. Leave my pot alone. I can break my pot. You can't break my pot. Resulting in a loss, which in turn, resulting in a loss, and that loss in turn results in an obligation to restore the state of the other to the condition prior to the loss in order to restore the relationship to a state of equilibrium. I've got a pot that's on the table. I invite you over to share dinner with me. You decide for I don't know what reason that you're going to break my pot and you're going to do it on purpose because you're going to get even for whatever I did to you whenever it was. And so you take my pot and you break it. You now owe me a pot. It gets worse than that, though. You not only owe me a pot, you owe me a restored relationship so that I can have you back in my house without worrying about you breaking my pot again. You have, there's been a death that's taken place in our relationship, not just a broken pot. So here's a, I tried to boil it down. If I can't boil it down, Hawkins is doing me no good at all. Evil is the unjust exercise of power to deprive another of a rightful possession, causing the victim a loss and leaving the perpetrator in debt. If there's no debt, there was no loss. If there was no, if there was a loss, there is a debt. And I'm coming to the conclusion, and frankly, uh, this has been an interesting experience, that was an exercise for me, that evil always results in a debt. And if there's no debt, there was no evil. Job. Well, it's a really interesting book because God describes Job as a righteous man who avoids, eschews, if you don't mind the old King James, he eschews evil. He avoids causing other people loss. He does everything in his life to avoid causing other people death and loss. It's, some, it's one of his values. You can trust him around your pots. God provokes Satan to pay attention to Job. And then Satan says, you know what? You break Job's pot, and he'll break off the relationship. And God just says, have at it. And the next couple of chapters is all about Job losing all his pots. All his pots but his wife. 
you know, a story that's humorous because she's the one who says, curse God and die. This isn't worth it. Interesting, a little later on in chapter 13, we have Job saying, go he slay me. I don't care how many pots of mine that God breaks, I will still put my hope in him. Broken pots do not, and this is Job's righteousness in my estimation. Job's righteousness is he never believes that God owes him, no matter how much loss he experiences. That's his righteousness. He never sees God as his debtor. He's a righteous man. And his friends, as Gideon noted, spend their time saying, look, repent, you owe God. Job rightly says, I don't owe God anything. I've given God everything I have. He owns me. I belong to him. I don't owe him any more than that because I have not sinned against him. I'm broken his pot. And he can break my pots. It's within the contract in a relationship. It's okay if he breaks my pots, you know, because they're not his my pots, they're his pots. And he's at peace about that with God. Does that change your understanding of the book of Job? <clears throat> What's missing from the book of Job that is very helpful in this context, in this conversation, is nobody has a problem with evil. Does God have a problem with evil in the book of Job? No, he doesn't. In fact, he never explains himself. He doesn't, he doesn't defend himself to anybody, including the reader. He doesn't explain himself to Job. He doesn't explain himself to Elihu, Zophar, Bildad, or Eliphaz. So doesn't explain himself to the wife. doesn't explain himself to anybody because he doesn't need to explain himself. He's done no evil. He doesn't explain his provocation to Satan to pay attention to Job. God feels no need to explain himself to anyone. That's interesting. Job feels no need to explain God to anyone. Isn't that interesting? Job fails as an apologist, if you will. So does Elihu, who's the other good guy, if you will. Nobody is cast in the role of explaining evil and putting things right conceptually or rationally or logically or ethically or morally or in terms of evil in the entire book. It's a record of a relationship between two people and how they worked out their relationship in the context of loss. That's why it's tremendously relevant to that snippet of the movie and completely left out. And I'll try to explain in a minute why it was left out. David put it this way, and this is, I think, important. The bones which you have broken rejoice, David says to God. And he has no problem with God breaking his bones. He doesn't just overlook it. He doesn't just push it out of sight or out of mind. He says, you broke my bones, and they're glad for it. And that's a little different perspective that we tend to bring to the suffering that happens in our lives that we call, what's the word we use when we suffer? Why has this evil happened to me? Now, here's where it gets really interesting. We're back at the tree of the knowledge of evil that God blessed Abraham, I mean uh, Adam and Eve with. God has no problem with having done that. Never explains it, never makes excuses, never really even talks much about it. But he does take responsibility for having done it. And he says, I'll take responsibility for what I've done, and I will do what needs to be done. Uh, 
I will restore the relationship to a state of equilibrium. How did God restore humanity to a state of equilibrium after evil is let loose because he put the tree of the intimate knowledge of evil in the garden? What did God do to restore equilibrium? Genesis 3.16. That was the beginning, but no. That was the beginning. That was only the beginning. That was the promise, though. It was the cross. At the cross, God paid for what he did. God put the tree of the knowledge of evil in the garden knowing that it would require that the Trinity be divided. He knew what it would cost him to put that tree in the garden, and he was willing to pay the price to restore the relationship, and he's the only one who can truly pay the price. That gets us to please understand that when I say you, it's for effect, because I want you to take this personally, but I take it personally as well. This is your problem with evil. You know you can't afford to pay the price. And that the price has to be paid. Anyone who wrestles with a problem of evil is primarily betraying a heart that says, I, I can't, I can't afford it. I don't want it. It's too much. It will cost me everything. I'm not willing to give up everything. I've got some dignity. I want to maintain my, my self-respect. And this is complete humiliation to take responsibility for all the loss I have caused in the world around me. So I'm going to redirect and try to blame it on God. I'm going to redirect and try to blame it on, oh, wait a minute, there is no God. Let's say there's no God, and if there's no God, there's no one to restore a relationship with. Let's just vacate the entire problem by simply saying, God doesn't exist. Or if he does, there's no way to know. you deal with your problem. Christians have a very similar problem. It is resolved in the cross for us. God has done his part. And that you and I spend the rest of our lives doing our part, paying for the evil that we've done by working to restore the relationships that we have caused loss in. It's called discipleship. It's called reconciliation. It's called restoration. And it's all fundamentally called love. That's why. Uh, got an answer there? Yeah, I see. <laughs> Believe me, I didn't miss that. <laughs> when it comes to atheism, this is my approach to the atheist. Very pastoral, very heart oriented. I don't care at all about an atheist's head. I don't care what he thinks. I don't care what he feels, to be really honest. I know his real problem. He doesn't want to take responsibility for what he knows his problem is. And so he redirects to find some. I raised seven children. There's no atheist around that hasn't tried something, isn't trying something. One of my kids tried. Redirection's a big one. And the atheist is just someone who was saying, I can't deal with this. I don't have any hope of pain. And the atheist may be one of the few people around who understands how big the debt is and how much it will cost to restore, and who really understands, I can't know. I won't. Well, why isn't the atheist just someone who's using Occam's razor more than you are by saying that things can be explained without bringing God, without bringing the fall, without bringing the tree, without bringing redemption, all those things, all those assumptions? Isn't that, isn't that because an this answer? is the atheist's problem and he cannot razor away, slice away, cut away any deeper than this bone. He has to answer those questions and Occam's razor takes him to those questions. It doesn't relieve him of them. Who do I answer to? He knows. Romans makes it clear. He knows he has to answer to God. What do I answer for? Everyone knows that evil out there, a world filled with evil, tells me I'm evil. I do evil things. 
and that's what I have to answer for them because I know they should answer for it. And finally, how do I pay the debt that I owe? Now the gospel's relevant because God says, you can't. I can. I will. No, it's better than that. I have. Let me. Let me pay it for you. There's the solution to the problem of evil. Am I done? If you're done, we do. All right. And I actually want to start with two questions because I think these I'm hoping these are easy questions first of all when you say that God uh, paid the debt and I think you used the word his debt no okay I didn't you, use you, the word debt okay you um, tied the cross the you, you tied the cross to him being accountable for putting the tree there. So, I'd like to... Now, the word I used was he took responsibility for what he did. Okay. Uh, the word responsibility is very important there. God has no trouble at all taking responsibility for what he does and doesn't do. But, but never... So so you're not in that. Here's the point. You're not in that saying that that God had a debt or is it... Or, you know, go, going back to your definition of evil, because you were pointing at that's so why I kind of included it in there. Fair so enough. you're not you're not, not no. equating those two. Okay. God doesn't owe anybody anything. And, and the Except second, he does owe to himself. Now, let me that brings sure. me to a, a, an important point. He does owe to himself to restore his relationship to Adam and Eve and their progeny. He doesn't owe it to us. He does owe it to himself because his love compels him to not leave it in a state of brokenness. So I would make that, art, uh, that argument off the cuff. Okay. Forgive me, it's not well thought out. And, and the other thing is, are you saying that in all of this you're really just addressing moral evil, or you, do you deny the existence of natural evil? If you deny, if you define natural evil as a, an amoral phenomenon, I don't have any problem with that. Evil is breakage. But nature does not owe us anything when it breaks our stuff. There's no debt because it's not personal. That's why definition, the definition has to include personal and it has to include intent. Nature has no intent. But would you, no so, so when Katrina killed 4,000 people, was that evil? Was there evil there? Biblically, yes. Okay. So you are differentiating. You're not denying that natural evil exists. You're just saying that really what we're dealing about is moral evil. I'm saying yes, that there that all evil is not moral evil. Okay. That evil is breakage. Okay. It's not. And I thought that was the case. I just wanted to clarify that okay. because. And just a quick question. That was it. That was it. You yep. have to. Oh, Gideon. I'm sorry. I. Fix it, Gideon. Fix it. No, no. Actually, like, you, you, I, let me just try to. I'm just trying to, try to um, get your head right understand. Around. Yes, what you're trying to say. <laughs> um, well, you are saying, but first of all, evil is objective. So, evil to us is also evil to God. Is that right? I mean, and no, no, not that's that. That makes it subjective. So, but does God see evil at all? Does they say things that are evil to God? He yes. is the objective, right? Yes. Yes. If evil is objective, then yeah. God is able to see evil. So whether we yes. see it or not, He and knows whether it is evil or not. We don't. We are subjective about evil because our our grid for understanding evil is that it caused me loss. And evil is breakage. So evil breaks God's heart. I mean, like, sure. <laughs> I mean, that's fine. That's a little clever, but so, it's true. So <laughs> evil breaks God's heart, and the problem of evil is that of God's problem too. Yeah. So the problem is, God by his own free volitions create a humanity that he loves. Now that humanity breaks its heart. And it is a problem because nobody told him that, well, why do you have to love that woman? That, that, that woman breaks your heart. But it's your choice. Is that basically what you're saying? I'm not saying nobody told him. I'm saying he went into it with his eyes wide open, knowing exactly what was going to happen. Oh, so. And he intended from the beginning to fix it. 
he put that tree of the, not, the intimate knowledge, and I want to keep bringing that in, that intimate knowledge of evil that he made available to Adam and Eve, he put it in the tree knowing what it would cost in the garden, knowing what it would cost him, what he would have to pay to restore the relationship, and did it willingly, and did it because he loves us. Motivated by his love for us, he put it in there. Yes? Um, I'm just, I'm curious if you would agree that following up on the question of natural evil versus moral evil, if moral evil then is breakage that has intent behind it, and natural evil is breakage without intent behind it. Do you I think would, that would be a fair I think that's a fair thing? way to look at it. Now, I've got a weasel statement. You want to hear my weasel statement? Sure. <laughs> we live in our weasel statements. Right? God knew what nature was going to break. So I do hold God responsible for whatever nature does. Because even though nature has no intent, God sometimes does intend using nature to break things, and sometimes just lets it take place, but still knows he's responsible for not stopping it. So you think he causes that evil? That's not what I said. Yeah. I'm asking. That's, no, I don't that's think why he causes the end yeah. of the statement. Okay. <laughs> that's a question. Uh, yeah. <laughs> no. I God has no problem causing amoral evil. You don't either. If the essence of evil is loss, and you go to a weight loss clinic, you're devoted to evil. I'm serious. Technically, that's what the word means. You have certain areas in your life where you're devoted to evil, in a biblical core concept. Nothing wrong with evil as, a, as an expression of loss. The wrongness with evil is intended cause of loss to someone else at the extent of a relate at the uh, expense of a relationship that results in a debt. You're 30 pounds overweight and you go work out and you lose 30 pounds. You committed an act of technically an act of evil, but there is no debt that you've created with another person. And I use person advisedly, not human beings necessarily, but another person that you owe. Evil is only immoral when it does not break up a relationship. A very biblical person was John Hexler. Yeah. How do you fit him in this picture? He understands exactly what I'm talking about and endorses it entirely. And where was the evil inflicted on him by a debt? I'm not... There were many that I'm aware of. Hanging him was one. When the Nazis hung him, yes. they caused a loss of life to him, and they owe him that. They can't pay it, but they owe him that loss that they took from him. There were many relationships that they made a mess of as well that they caused him loss. Yes. So like the they were getting all four corners. This is great, but I don't know what you guys are doing. <laughs> <laughs> the standard example of like uh, you pull up to a red light and there's nobody around and you just run it, right? It's mm -hmm. evil. There's no loss to anyone else. Maybe loss of your own integrity or some sense <laughs> of that. But is this evil? Breaking government laws and God tells us to follow the government, but there's no there's no loss or seen loss. There's no loss to another person. There is a potential loss to you. If that causes you a crisis of conscience that you can't live with, I'd say don't run. What if your teenager is next to you in the car? Well, that's a whole different world that's because different you have right? caused a loss to that teenager. You've taken from that teenager a respect from the law, for the law. And you owe that teenager and you'll never be able to pay it. So don't. You were talking about moral and natural, I think. I'm looking at a definition that we did with Oz Guinness and I think Roger Zacharias. So that evil was active intent to do harm. And suffering is the passive or experiential. Uh, I was just thinking that's interesting to think about what you said about moral and natural. Suffering can be amoral. Suffering can be moral. Discipline. What's a disciple? Yeah. Someone is under discipline. What is discipline? Suffering. Hebrews 11 and 12. 
if you're following Jesus, you're going to suffer. Suffering is not evil. That's one of the reasons. That's kind of where this list started yeah. out. Yeah, yeah, I yeah. want you to understand suffering is not evil. Nothing on this list is evil in and of itself. Well, if I may make an observation on that point. Sure. So, like what you quote, Michael just quote was more the intention or the or the causal side of, of evil. Yeah. But you're, what you are saying is you want to focus on the consequence and uh, and the effect. I want you to understand that it's the consequence and effect that determines whether an evil is moral or immoral. That's the point I'm trying to drive home, Nathan. So it seems to me that the core issue for the heart is coming to that point of, of believing that whatever God does, he does not incur a debt. That is That's important to understand. Point yes. of, of what Job and David and even the people in you know, Auschwitz. Mm -hmm. uh, Some of them that. understood that. Right. What is it about God that allows him to break things and never incur a debt? Anybody? He owns it. It's all his. There you go. Well, you, can't, you can't owe someone else when you break what's yours. Can you? Yeah. If, if for example, um, it's the sovereignty. You, you allow your child to use your pot, and then at some point, after they've been using it for a while and begin thinking of it as their own, you come along and take it away again. You don't owe them a pot because you gave it to them in the first place. It's entirely subjective on that child's part. Most of your problems, most of your perception of suffering is entirely subjective and you're completely out of touch with reality. You're not. And no one owes you anything. Job said it best. The Lord giveth, the Lord taketh away. Blessed be the name Blessed of the Lord. Blessed be the name of the Lord. And, you know, and I think that that's important in regards to the bigger picture. Uh, I think it was you earlier that had mentioned, you know, or at least touched on this issue about whether God's on trial. And, and I think that it's fair that there's this question about, about the problem of evil. But I, I think it's also important to recognize, and I think oftentimes this is the answer. If there is a God, doesn't he have the right to do whatever he wants to do? Are you familiar with the four conditions of the word if? Just so you don't have to answer it, so no one knows if you knew or no. One of the conditions is translated since. And that sentence would make a great deal more sense if you started it with since God exists rather than if God exists. Okay, but the question means. the question is whether God exists or not. <laughs> so if the if you take as a precondition, if you if you let's assume that God does exist then since God exists. Okay. Doesn't he have the right to do whatever he wants? I mean, to the, to the point that, you know, we put some we know that God is is benevolent and but but he didn't necessarily, you know, we could conceive of a God that is malevolent, but even then if he's God, can he do anything that he wants to do? He's entitled to be malevolent. Because he's because God is all sovereign over everything. So I think that it's important, and again, I, I don't think I focus too much on the malevolent side of that, but that when we're, you know, and I thought about it when we saw the clip from the movie, that, that at some point we have to realize that, and I, and I still will use the word if because that's the question, that if there is a God, He's entitled to do whatever he wants to do, and he doesn't have to answer to me about it. He doesn't have to answer to you. He doesn't have to answer to you, anybody. So, the, so I think that there's that dividing thing. I think that it is appropriate to address the question, but at some level, we have to acknowledge that if there is a God, then really he's beyond question, because that by de that's kind of by definition God. Yes, I've been waiting for you to wait back in. I don't think that. It's a matter of like he has the right to do whatever he wants. I don't think that's helpful. I just think like that's we want to believe in a good and just God, and like we, if it's the idea of like we want to follow this God, whether or not like am I gonna choose to devote my life to him? Am I gonna choose to like do X, Y, and Z? If so, I think it, it is a it, it's not a it, it is a big deal. Like do we? Like, who are we choosing to believe? Is this like a love, all loving father? Or is this some guy who randomly just slaughters 70,000 people to, to prove a point? And I think that makes a big difference. Okay. Like, and choosing, like, 
what we want to sh like if we're choosing to base our whole lives off of that and we're choosing to share that with people and like yeah that actually is not a small thing Okay, and I'm not saying it's a small thing, but what I am saying, and let's take for, for example, because we are talking about an omnibenevolent God, then that means when he decides to do whatever he wants to do, that it is good. It, it can't, that God cannot do evil because he is good all of Daniel? Oh, yeah, I was going to say that um, it's technically correct to say God has the right to do whatever he wants to do with his creation. But a more complete understanding of the of the picture of the reality at hand here is we know that God is has an immutable nature, an unchanging nature. And we know that central to his nature is love and goodness. And so although in a technical sense, yes, God could do whatever he wanted to, we know because of his nature and because what he's revealed to us about himself that there are things that he won't do. Not that he doesn't have the right, but he won't because of who he is. And I think that's critical. Well, mm -hmm. I just want to try to explain his position, not necessarily mine, but what he is essentially saying is that the question is not my choice or your choice. The question is God's choice. And the question, really, his transformation is like, it becomes like, why did God choose to love human knowing that humans would break his heart? And the Bible, Bible apparently never explained that. Why he got? Why did God choose us? But the the, the Bible never explained that. It gives us some clues when it says um, that He loves us, knowing we'll break His heart. There's a fascinating book. But but why not like angels? Why not dogs and cats? Why have why we us? Yeah. Never explained. Okay. Who knew? Uh, Townsend wrote a book on boundaries, and there's a fascinating statement in it that talks about uh, yes and no. He said, and this had a huge impact on me, as you can tell. He said, Ev all your friends, everybody in your life will love your yes. When they ask you for something and you say yes, they will love you. And they will love your yes. Your friends will love your no. When you say no to a friend, your friend will say, thank you for telling me no. Thank you for caring enough about me to tell me no. You must care about me. That's God. God's devotion to us is unlimited. He's willing to suffer anything and to cause us any suffering at all in his love and devotion to us. We tend to miss that. But, but don't you see there is still a little problem there, like people say that dogs are more faithful than human beings. So that, that makes a kind of like... not as much fun to talk to. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Depends I get on that. <laughs> <laughs> How is it that we determine which of these things we know, such as God loves us, and which things are up for grabs, such as uh, are these things really evil or not, are they good for me or not, and so on. Now, all we can do is, we're born, we look with our eyes, we read this Bible, or we look, read this book in front of us that has this leather cover, and we look at it, we try to make sense of it, we look at the world, we try to make sense of it. Uh, why is it that some things are things that are set down, these things it's kind of assumed. Everyone knows that God exists. You say the, to use the word since. Since God, why? Why is that? Why do we know for sure that that God is loving? And then these other things are all the things that are for grabs. That's why I say, go back to Occam's Razor. Why not? Why not say, let, let's let's put it all on the table and say, let's start it fresh and say, what are the things that are really needed in order to make sense of the world? And maybe maybe a lot of this problem would go away if you even take God out of the picture. Well, I think that's where the uh, authority of Scripture and the and the why God why God gave us His Word is You're so. You're making all sorts of assumptions. Why God gave us His Word? Yeah, that's sounding pretty complex. Let me read what William said. William of Ockham believed, quote, "Only faith gives us access to theological truths. The ways of God are not open to reason. This, in some ways, is an exercise in futility." For God has freely chosen to create a world and establish a way of salvation within it, apart from any necessary laws that human logic or rationality can uncover. He believed that only science was a matter of discovery, and so God is the only ontological necessity. His razor said everything outside of God is unnecessary. His razor took him to God rather than eliminating God and trying to deal with what's left if you take him out. 
That's wrong. Okay. I'm a fan of Williams. <laughs> I want to make one comment about Occam's razor is that it's not that the simplest answer is the best, it's all else considered equal, the simplest answer is the best. And yeah, so I think when when uh, a Christian chooses to put, say, this is God doing this, they're not just thinking, well, I'm only thinking about the evil and then I must apply God to that. They're thinking about mm -hmm. other things that they see God doing, other uh, sources that you know, cause it to not be completely equal with the argument that there is no God. Yeah. I mean, I would, I would say there's an experiential part of this, too. I and mean, you said a lot has to be based on observation. A lot of people experience things that they observe in themselves, that they, they come to the conclusion that the Actually, the best explanation of the, is that there is a God that is communicating with you, right? And um, we are trapped in our subjectivity. We yeah. never forget that you have no objectivity at all. You have no objectivity. And our time, I think, I, I'm sorry to say before you said something. I have no objectivity. Our time horizon is, is a major issue. So if you ask me, what was evil when I was 12? What was evil when I was 14, when I was 18? Uh, my first year of marriage versus my 24th year of marriage. Um, You're getting better at it? Yeah. Well, my <laughs> experience factor and then my knowledge of God factor. So if you thought about personal evil, sin, mm -hmm. or if you thought about um, natural evil, or what's the other one? Um, suffering. So what I might have interpreted as suffering on that first day, 10 years later, is oh, Thank you for that gift, God. And the same thing you said, uh, that Daniel was reminding us about the feeling of pain. Right? So, hello, thank you. And I responded, um, oh, who was it? Hawking, we talked a few nights ago. What could have his reaction have been about the pain of his physical life that he's gone through? Yes, sometimes that does point you to God, as in Hawking saying mm -hmm. so. But I think it, it's, part of it is our time horizon. Um, I don't know, it's a lot of things. Our, sub, our subjectivity, Dr. our subjectivity. Dr. Becker said something really interesting about, uh, uh, what's his name? Paul Hoffa. No, uh, Stephen Hoffa. Yeah. Stephen Hoffa. Okay. Thank you. I don't know yeah. why that's so, you, well, I asked you if he is a man of integrity, and you assured us that he is. Yes. Yeah. And I know that if he is the man of integrity, and you believe he is, he will work on his relationship with God and be restored. I don't know how he's going to do that, how God's going to work that out, but if he's an honest man, that's where he'll end up, because that's where integrity takes you. Now, I hope tonight hasn't been a disappointment to you. If it is, it's me. Uh, God created a specific ex uh, experience for you here tonight. If he's saying something to you, ask him for clarity. He really would like you to leave with some Word of reassurance that he does in fact love you, he does in fact have good plans for you, he does in fact want to move you into new areas. So thank you very much. You have been fun. Uh, it's, I'm, it's just after 9 o'clock. Yeah, we're, we'll wrap up, but most yeah, of you'd like to stay in those and I'll stay as long as you want to. All right. Uh,